so that will that brings me uh, very nicely to our last speaker, Chunyi uh, Zhang from Temple University. Uh, Chunyi is a member of the CSI Center. Um, she received her PhD from Peking University in 2019. Um, following that, she do, she joined uh, Shifan Wu's group uh, as a postdoc at Temple. Um, and today, Chunyi is going to tell us about deep modeling with long range electrostatic interactions. Um, and I will uh, give you the floor, Chunyi. Thank you, Zach. Also, thanks a lot to the organizers for this exciting workshop. And hi, everyone. I'm going to continue to talk about deep modeling, but I will focus on including the long range electron static interactions. And uh, my talk will include two parts. In the first part, I will introduce the deep potential long range method. We can also call it DPLR for short. It's developed by this work, which extended the DP method by explicitly including the long range electron static interactions. In this first part, I will introduce the basic ideas of this work. It includes why we need to include long range interactions and how to include long range interactions. And also I will illustrate DPLR using some simple examples. In the second part, I will apply the DPLR method to calculate the dielectric constant of water and sodium chloride solutions. Now let's focus on the first part and answer this first question. Why do we need to include long range interactions? After today and yesterday's workshop, you must have known that the DP method overcomes the dilemma between accuracy versus efficiency. So it allows us to overcome uh, a lot of problems that is previously impossible to be solved either due to the limit of accuracy or due to the limit of efficiency. There are lots of successful applications. Uh, for example, in the prediction of the phase diagram of water, the reactive uptake of N2O5 in interfacial processes, the liquid liquid phase transition in supercooled water, the proton transfer in the water TRO2 interface, and uh, the microscopic structure of sodium chloride solutions, just to name a few. Despite the above success, we have to mention that, like most machine learning models, DP has one important limitation, it lacks explicit long range interactions. Because the potential energy in DP is the sum of atomic energies and this atomic energy EI of atom I is determined by the local environment of atom I within a cutoff radius RC. So it's a local representation However, the electrons and the nuclear in the system are charged particles that experience long range Coulomb forces. This is missing in DP. This approximation of DP works well in many cases. However, in some occasions it fails. For example, when the studied property are affected by the long range electron static interactions, such as the dielectric constant. Also for cluster and vapor phase, while the long range electron static interactions are not significantly screened as in the condensed phase system. And also for systems that has large charge separation, for example, the electrolyte solutions in contact with electrodes, bipolar surface, protein folding problems, Let's say one simple example is the potential energy profile of water dimer. This picture displays the potential energy of the water dimer as a function of the distance between the two water molecules. The black line is predicted by DFT. The red line is predicted by DP. The DP model used here is trained with the DFT data of water slab water interface and bulk water. We didn't include water dimer into the training configuration. And the, the cutoff radius of this DP model is for astron. 
we can see beyond this cutoff distance, the DP model cannot successfully reproduce this energy curve. According to theory, the dipole-dipole interaction should result in a one over d cubed tail. This is well captured by DFT, but is missing in DP. So for a more accurate description, we need to include the long-range interactions. But how to include long-range interactions? This work has provided us with a very nice and efficient method. It's called DPLR. It extended the DP model by explicitly including the long-range electron static interactions, which largely improves the accuracy and predictive power of DP. Uh, the theory and method of DPLR is like this. It assumes that the potential energy surface has contributions from two parts. One is the short-range contribution, the other is the long-range contribution. The short-range contribution in DPLR is treated as in the standard DP model, and the long-range contribution refers to the long-range electrostatic interaction between the ions and the valence electrons this is approximated by the distribution of the spherical Gaussian charges located at the ionic and electronic sites. And here, the electronic sites is rigorously defined in terms of the center of the maximum localized one-year distributions. We can also call it one-year centroid. Taking a water molecule as an example, each water molecule has four one-year centers as indicated by this uh, blue and green dots. And the one-year centroid is the geometry center of these four one-year centers, as indicated by this purple dot. And this one-year centroid is predicted by the deep one-year neural network. Now we can represent the coordinates of the ice ion and the nth one-year centroid as Ri and Wn. The charge density can be represented as this. Here, this Ri is the charge density of the ion I. It equals to Qi multiply a delta function. Qi is the charge of ion I. And this rho n is the sum of the maximum localized one-year distributions associated with the nth one-year centroid. In DPLR, we approximate rho i and rho n use the spherical Gaussian charge distributions and denoted as g i and g n. And the spread of this spherical Gaussian charge distribution is one over the square root of two and beta. Here, beta is an adjustable parameter. And in simulation, we should choose a beta to make the spherical Gaussian charge smooth enough at the atomic scale and also well localized within the cutoff radius. It has been proved in the DPLR paper that this approximation is efficient and only induces negligible errors. Now, the electrostatic energy of this system can be easily calculated using the Ewald sum for the Gaussian charges under periodic boundary conditions. Now, we have know why we need to include the long range interactions and how the DPLR method includes it. Next, let's see some simple examples. The first one is the potential energy profile of water dimer. We have discussed the DFT and DP results in our previous slides. Now let's see the DPLR result. It's indicated by this blue line. We can see compared to DP, DPLR is much closer to the DFT results. And uh, it uh, successfully recovers the long range coulomb tail. And uh, this accuracy here of DPLR in this intermediate range can be further improved by increase this cutoff radius. It can also be improved by including the water dimer into the training configuration. 
The second example is the, the free energy of the interaction of a water molecule with liquid water slab as a function of the distance between this water molecule and the center of the water slab. In the lower panel, this red line is the difference between DPE and DFT. This blue line is the difference between DPLR and DFT. We can see DPLR is closer to the DFT results. Moreover, it has smaller error bar than the DP results. These points all tell us that DPLR has a higher accuracy than DP. Now let's move on to the second part. Apply the DPLR method to calculate the dielectric constant of liquid water. Why we choose the dielectric constant of liquid water as an example? Because the large dielectric constant of water is one of the most important anomalous property of water, and the precise prediction of its dielectric constant is important for understanding the hydrogen bond network in water. It's also important for understanding water's role as solvent. However, the calculation of the dielectric constant has uh, long been a challenge because the computational cost is very large. The hydrogen bond network in water results in both long dipole-dipole correlation time and the large dipole-dipole correlation length. So the converged dielectric constant needs a simulation time of tens of nanoseconds, and the simulation box should contain hundreds of water molecules. So we need an efficient simulation method at the same time, we need an accurate description of both the atomic and electronic degrees of freedom. At the same time, we also need the long range because the long range dipole-dipole interaction is important for the dielectric constant. All these points make the calculation of the dielectric constant of liquid water a perfect example for DPLR. For comparison, we conducted both DP and DPLR simulation. All these simulations were conducted at 330 K. We increased the simulation temperature because to, uh, to account for approximately the 40 K difference in the melting temperature of our system with respect to real water. This table shows the simulation cell size and the simulation time. The largest system simulated in this work has more than 100,000 water molecules. The DP, DPLR, and the deep one-year models here are all trained with scan zero DFT data. Because in our previous work, we have found that scan zero performs better in modeling liquid water than the scan functional. Now let's see the simulation results. First, we compare the dipole-dipole correlation function predicted by DP and DPLR. First, we need to calculate the dipole of each water molecule using the position of the hydrogen atom, the position of the oxygen atom, and also the position of the one-year centroid. Then we calculate the dipole-dipole correlation function. The dipole-dipole correlation function defines the correlation between the dipoles. It can be understood in this way. For each central water molecule I, we draw a three-dimensional spherical shear at radius R, and then we calculate the average Poisson angle between mu I and mu J. Mu J is the molecular dipole of this molecule J that locates in this spherical shear. Then we compare the DP, DPLR result of the dipole-dipole correlation function in these two pictures. The y-axis is plotted in log scale and different colors represent results using different cell size. Obviously, these two pictures are different at long distance. According to theory at long distance, the dipole correlation function should decay to a constant. And the value of this constant is a function of one over L cube. Here, this L cube, L is the length of the simulation box. We can see in DPLR simulation, the dipole correlation function decays to a constant as expected. 
and this constant depend on the cell length. However, in DP, the dipole correlation function decays exponentially due to the lack of long range interactions. Therefore, it is important to include the long range interactions into the simulation of the dielectric properties. We also did a further quantitative analysis of this DPLR. First, we check whether the converged constant predicted by DPLR has this one over LQ behavior. So we plotted the converged constant at each cell length as the red squares in this picture. And uh, we also conducted a nonlinear curve fit using A over L cube. And we find the DPLR result agree well with the A over L cube behavior. And the fitted A equals to 75.4. Actually, this A equals to this function. And uh, so we did a self consistent check of this constant A. We use the results obtained from our simulation to substitute in this function and get an A equals to 75. It's very close to the fitted results. This further validates our DPLR simulation. Next, we calculate the static dielectric constant epsilon from DPLR simulations using the linear response approach. The static dielectric constant can be calculated either using the correlation formula or the fluctuation formula. In the correlation formula, it's calculated by the integration of the dipole correlation function. In the fluctuation formula, it's calculated by the fluctuation of the total dipole n of the whole system. We notice here on the left-hand side of these two formulas, besides epsilon, there's another variable epsilon prime. That depends on the electronic boundary condition. We will discuss this later. And for now, we just fix the electric boundary condition at the metallic boundary condition and compare the results using these two formulas. The picture on the left-hand side is the dielectric constant from the correlation formula. The right hand side is that from the fluctuation formula. Different colors is simulation results using different cell size. We can find in these two pictures besides the black line, which use 64 water molecules, all other simulations converges to a dielectric constant of about 103. So the results predicted by these two formulas are consistent. The black line failed to arrive at a converged dielectric constant because the box length is smaller than the dipole-dipole correlation length. Then we compare the different electric boundary conditions. First, let's see the physical meaning of different electric boundary conditions. This is our simulation box. It has a total dipole M. Due to the periodic boundary condition, it interacts with all its replications, and the number of replications is infinite. However, our real macroscopic system has a particular boundary, so we only add the electrostatic interactions of these replications within a macroscopically large sphere. And this dashed circle represents the boundary of this macroscopically large sphere. And the boundary of a polar system has surface charge on it. The magnitude of this surface charge is affected by the dielectric constant outside this sphere. We can denote it as epsilon prime. And the interaction energy of this surface charge with this dipole can be represented by this function. We revise the LAMS code to include this turn into the Hamiltonian to realize different boundary conditions. And the different boundary conditions correspond to different values of epsilon prime. Under the metallic boundary condition, epsilon prime equals to infinite. It is equivalent to shortcut our system, so the surface charge equals to zero, and the, the surface energy also disappears. 
Under the Kf boundary condition, epsilon prime equals to epsilon. This is equivalent to merge our simulated system into an infinite large million that has the same property. The third boundary condition is the insulating boundary condition where epsilon prime equals to zero. This is equivalent to open circuit our system. Then we compare the dipole-dipole correlation function obtained from different boundary conditions. We have known that the dipole correlation function decays to a constant at large distance, and the value of this constant depends on the cell length L and also on the electric boundary condition epsilon prime. Here we fix the cell size at about 4,000 water molecules and just to focus on different electric boundary conditions. So for simplicity, we write this part as a constant B. Under the metallic boundary condition, epsilon prime equals to infinity. So this dipole correlation function decays to half of B. Under Kf boundary condition, this constant becomes zero. Under the insulating boundary condition, it becomes minus B. And this picture is our simulated result. We can see it's very close to the predicted result because under metallic boundary condition, it converges to a positive constant. Under Kf boundary condition, it converges to zero. And under insulating boundary condition, it converges to a minus constant. And the magnitude of this is about twice that under the metallic boundary condition. Then we calculate the dielectric constant by integrated dipole correlation function. We find the dielectric constant obtained from different boundary conditions are consistent. And I'd like to mention here from the different tails of different boundary condition, we can say the DPLR method is necessary here because without the correct prediction of the long-range dipole-dipole interaction, we are unable to successfully simulate the dielectric constant at different boundary conditions. We also applied the DPLR method to calculate the dielectric constant of sodium chloride solutions. Sodium chloride solutions are ubiquitous on Earth and it plays important roles in many biological and chemical processes. So understanding the dielectric constant of sodium chloride solutions is important for us for understanding these biological and chemical processes. In the early 20th century, experiments have found that when we add the salts into water, the dielectric constant will decrease. This picture displays the dielectric constant of sodium chloride solution as a function of the solute concentration. These are all experimental results. We find that when the concentration increase, the dielectric constant decrease. We can call this a dielectric decrement. We can also find that this decrement behavior is nonlinear. To understand this nonlinear dielectric decrement behavior on the molecular level, an ab initio investigation is indispensable. However, due to the large computational cost, so far only empirical force field have been applied to study this phenomenon. In this work, thanks to the DPLR method, we can study this on the ab initio level. We studied six different concentrations, and this table shows the number of sodium chloride ion pair and the number of water molecules simulated at each concentration. And each concentration was simulated for about 20 nanoseconds. The results are presented as this black line. We scaled our results because our results are larger than the experimental results. However, in this work, we want to focus on the change of the dielectric constant with concentration. So we multiplied our scaling factor to our simulated results to make the first point agree with the experimental results. We find our scaled result agree well with the experiment conducted at 1966. 
More analysis about the origin of this nonlinear dielectric decrement behavior will be presented in our upcoming paper. In conclusion, we reviewed the DPLR method. It includes its importance, theory method, and some simple examples. And we calculated the dielectric constant of liquid water using the DPLR method. We find that the long-range electrostatic interactions are important for the correct prediction of the dielectric constant. We find that scan functional estimated a dielectric constant of 103. This is larger than the experimental result of 78, which indicates that scan zero functional overestimated edge bound strength of liquid water. We also find that the dielectric constant calculated using different formulas and different electric boundary conditions are consistent. We also reproduced the dielectric constant of sodium chloride solutions. Finally, I would like to thank my collaborators in the calculating of the dielectric constant of liquid water and sodium chloride solutions. These two projects are conducted at Temple University. It's a collaboration with the Princeton University. And I want to thank Mike Shifan, Shu Wen, Yifan, Lingfeng, Han, Sanos, and Roboto for their contributions to these works. That's all. Thank you for your kind attention. Thanks so much, Shinyi. It's wonderful. Um, hopefully, we will have a couple of questions coming up. People can also. Uh, uh, raise their hand or unmute themselves, but I uh, recommend using the Q&A. So while people get their questions typed in, um, I will just advertise that uh, Chun Yi will be uh, running a tutorial this afternoon uh, regarding DPLR. Uh, so stay tuned, all of you attending the tutorial for that. Someone raised the hand, I think. Oh, oh there was. Uh -oh. I do I see, yes, I see that as well. Um, I'll, I'll allow this person to talk, so I'll give them a few seconds to get their questions started. Otherwise, I'll deem it as a mistake. And I have allowed her talking. And going once, going twice. Okay. Hello? Is there a question? No. Okay, I'm going to assume. Uh, not. Okay. 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 Uh, there's another raised hand, Jian Li Cheng. I'm going to let you talk, so please go ahead if there's a question. Hey guys, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much for the great talk. I really enjoyed the, uh, you know, the, the, the comparisons. It looks, uh, the results look absolutely awesome. So I just have a, kind of like a, <laughs> uh, maybe a little bit stupid questions. So when I talk about, uh, we compare the, uh, Sorry, I don't remember exactly. You compare the DP and your uh, uh, DPR uh, in terms of the feeding uh, the A over L cubed, if I remember correctly. So, and uh, but for me, it looks to me like a, for DP results um, at the very large, I think R is starting to get the constant. So, I mean, if uh, let's say uh, we increase maybe more of the R, do you expect uh, it will be a constant again? Uh, what size is your simulation cell? Um, I think you, you showed uh, you N equals to, I think, 46 to like a, a couple of thousand. So I'm just saying that uh, if you increase the R, uh, the X axis, do you expect uh, the, the result from the DP to be constant? Or you see, you, it will be still, it will keep the decline. Uh, I'm not sure. it's Does well, my question make sense? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you mean yeah, when yeah, you right small, small cell size, you'll find it's a constant, right? 
Uh, yeah, is, yeah, the blue one, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, almost... you needed to you needed to simulate in large cell to find the real real property. Yeah, but if you look at the the gray one, I think uh, near let's say sixty five to yeah, seventy, yeah, yeah. starting yeah. to get the you know constant. If uh, so, if I increase let's say eighty, um, do you think it will be you know like uh, the value will be similar to the seventy uh, to to the seven seventies? Uh, to, to, to 70s. Yeah, let's say the R, right? So in, in, in the green uh, yeah. line. So let's say here you, I think your cutoff is like 75, but let's say uh, uh, we, we simulate a few more points up to 90. Do you think uh, uh, the, you know, those values will be similar to the, you know, between 60, uh, 65 no. to, to 70s? No, no, it will be decay here. I cut here okay. because the simulation box will end. And if we oh, want to go large size, we need a large box. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. all right, thanks. And also when you talk about the, um, um, I think a few, I think the slides, I don't remember the slides number, but uh, when you talk about the water, water interactions, is that uh, uh, hydrogen, oxygen, uh, is that the hydrogen bond between these two, uh, between the water molecules? Yes. You, uh, no, no. only when the distance is small, that's hydrogen bond. But we hear oh. the largest is 10. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Um, right, thank you. Terrific. So I think in the interest of giving uh, everyone a break before the tutorial uh, uh, ended here, sorry to... Um, the, the other person with their hand raised. Um, there's, I think, a couple of questions, Chen Yi, in the in the Q and A. Maybe if you don't mind uh, typing uh, your answers to those, if they want to hang on uh, and wait uh, for your response. Um, otherwise, thanks uh, so much to all of our speakers for another terrific morning session. Um, as I mentioned, in uh, I guess now nine minutes, um, we will begin uh, the the second uh, tutorial part as well. So thanks everyone. Just a reminder that the um, tutorial workshop part will be at the other Zoom link, um, which you should have uh, from yesterday. Um, so thanks again, everyone, and take care.